Hello, I'm here to talk to you about object-oriented programming and the, I think it's called the squaring the circle, or excuse me, not squaring the circle, it is the square circle problemo. Oh no, why do I keep thinking circle? I don't, I always do this. It's not squaring the circle, it's the square rectangle problem inheritance problem whatever also called the circle ellipsis problem here they're virtually the same thing so the circle of course i'm here on wikipedia the circle ellipsis problem in software development sometimes called the square rectangle problem illustrates several pitfalls which can arise when using subtype polymorphism polymorphism in object modeling. The issues are most commonly encountered when using object-oriented programming, OOP. By definition, this problem is a violation of the Liskov substitution principle, one of the solid principles. The problem concerns which subtyping or inheritance relationship should exist between classes which represent circles and ellipses, or similarly squares and rectangles. More generally, the problem illustrates the difficulties which can occur when a base class contains methods which mutate an object in a manner which may invalidate a stronger invariant found in a derived class, class, causing the Liskov substitution principle to be violated. The existence of the circle ellipse problem is sometimes used to criticize object-oriented programming. It may also imply that hierarchical taxonomies are difficult to make universal, implying that situational classification systems may be more practical. So the answer to this problem lies in that exact part right there. It is a uh, it's used to criticize object-oriented programming. Eh, wrong. That is bad. Anybody who's going to criticize object-oriented programming because of this does not understand object-oriented programming. Um, it may also imply that hierarchical, hierarchical <laughs> taxonomies are difficult to make universal. Bing, that's exactly what it is right there. That's why you don't want to do big upfront design. You should not be modeling classes no way if anything you can model your classes in height in hindsight for some reason like for an integrated development environment that might be something practical where you could like pop up a view of the class structure or something um, as it stands but you should not be going forward from you know zero like with nothing from scratch building up like okay i i think i'm gonna need this type of a class you know you'll do a little tiny bit maybe of that on the fly but you really shouldn't even be thinking like that you could should be thinking more from the perspective of how can i get away without using a class you know maybe you could quickly come to the conclusion that well you know you're using a class centric language and you're probably going to need a class by the way javascript is not a class centric language it's an object centric language the classes were added in just a few years back and that that was a a patch in because so many people were used to class centric designs of last century's technologies um JavaScript was one of the few languages, the very, very few languages to actually embrace true object-oriented programming, which no languages, not even C++, not even Java, or none of those other end of the century so-called object-oriented programming languages, none of those truly embraced a more proper, the more pure object-oriented paradigm. Um, part of it is that they aren't dynamic object-oriented programming languages in the general sense of dynamic typing. I guess you could say the duck interface, you know, the uh, you go by HAZA, lean more towards composition in a HAZA relationship than an ISA. You know, you're not so concerned whether or not something's a const or any of that, any of that stuff in those languages that you pit before a variable name when you're defining defining a variable besides maybe var um like var right but anything other than that that you would pit before a variable that's signaling not pure object-oriented paradigm just so you know 
an object is an object is an object basically and the way you decide what's different about it is by its behaviors ideally exclusively but very heavily leaning towards that you should not think of objects as a bag of data if you are thinking of them you know if you're using objects of bags of, as bags of data they're just bags of data you could do that with just a structural programming language you don't need a uh, object oriented programming language to have bags of data <laughs> you know what i mean so but then they tried to just tack on at the end of last century and you know whatever they tried to tack on like oh they're bags of data with related functionality you know and they kind of were and that was made it easier for people like me to transition and go oh now i can see this little baby step i can take into object oriented programming land and it's not that big of a drastic of a change and plus you know all the way at least into the early 2000s a lot of computers you know the more you go back the slower computers were and just a few lines of code that were written inefficiently which still holds true today in a lot of cases but back then it was so blatantly obvious like there was so much of the time where if you were creating an object just to do it just to be mr pure ivory tower object oriented programming person or uh mrs or whatever you go by um you know, then you were looked at like, wow, this person's over here like virtue signaling objects when they could get away with just a little integer and it'd be 16 or 32 bits of memory and it wouldn't have to be unboxed or anything like that. And it would just run, especially for stuff like Java and JavaScript that was like over the web in the browser kind of thing. Um, even Java was like last century was primarily in the browser, I want to say, at least from my experience. And you're dealing with like 486s and Pentium 1 computers, you know, that just had could barely do what what they were doing let alone when you try and bring in fancy big bulky libraries or uh languages and environments like that so anyway that also let you know it was between just people being so used to structured programming for the last you know most part of the last couple decades at that time and then transitioning and then just the optimizations it was so often easier to just not create an object not make everything an object and to this day i say don't make everything an object but consider making everything you know an object so just think about the implications of making something an object but oftentimes it's easier to use like loose variables or whatever so to speak that you just can you know if you want to do an integer do an integer fine but even in python an integer i believe in ruby too um i'm not absolutely sure about javascript i haven't used that in a minute but anyway for sure i could say in python an integer is you know a number is an object you can go in with the interpreter i chose to use python 3.4 today i know it's kind of old you know it's like four years old now or what five years old now but anyway it actually works with xp also so i like to go back i consider this like my low ball pipe python 3 it's like the lowest version of python 3 that i really care to make stuff compatible with a lot of times because there are a lot of like xp machines out in the wild still and uh you know knowing that you can just throw a python 3.4 interpreter and like get more years out of that hardware i like that idea and uh it just you know i don't know i like it so anyway i'm using it today but it's not a whole lot different than like python 3.8 is kind of my go-to right now python 3.9 as we speak is kind of like fresh new but uh from what i'm seeing it doesn't beat python 3.8 in the benchmarks for speed and that's kind of what I care about now because all the features I care about for the most part are in Python 3.7 and Python 3.7 alone was really fast that one was I just felt like they really got over the hump with that one and it was like you know it had arrived as far as speed goes and then I was looking I was hesitant to upgrade to 3.8 because um I wasn't seeing any features that I specifically cared about, so I thought, oh, it's probably just bigger and bulkier and slower. I'll just stick with 3.7 for now. It's still getting updates and all that. And uh, then, I, like I said, I saw that benchmark, and I was like, okay, 
3.8 has more features and it runs significantly faster than 3.7. But anyway, that's all to say. And then 3.9, it's starting to go back the other way a little bit, adding more features and starting to slow down a little bit, not drastically from what I can see. But so I'm sticking with 3.8. But what I'm here to talk about right now does not matter if you're even using Python. I'm just using Python because it's one of the simplest languages for the most part um, for demonstrating simple things but it can get very advanced very quickly too. The reason it's more, it tends to be more syntax simple, uh, I should say. But Python, if you don't miss, if you don't realize that this is um, one of the most advanced languages that's available today, which is really good to say on one hand, but really sad to say on the other for different reasons that I won't get into right now. But uh, yeah, this, this language, don't think this is a little play like high school, college only language or something. That's the kind of stuff I thought about like, oh, Python's for like wussies or something that don't, you know, script kids and stuff like that. And like, I'm not a script kid anymore. I've grown up. But anyway, that's, I've learned over the last couple of years or so that, um, I guess the last three years, I've learned that that's absolutely not true, that Python's very powerful. Um, don't be deceived by its simplicity because that's what stuff's about <laughs> you know what i mean with a big enough stick you can lift the you can leverage the world right so it doesn't matter what's carved on that stick or how complex it is to put the stick together or something it's like if that stick's just a regular old board and it gives you the leverage you need then that's all that matters so i've gotten to the point where i can write bigger badder simpler programs in python and turn around and try and implement the same thing in C and use the Python prototype as the reference and I'm still struggling to get the thing done in C and it's taken me you know at least twice as long and then when I go back and look at it I'm like wow I would have never I don't think I've been able to do this implement this feature or whatever functionality without a prototyping in Python first so I don't know why I went off on that rant but anyway um, we're here to talk about this. This is object-oriented programming in general and why you should avoid class hierarchies. So what we're going to do is I already have this file open. I went ahead, so I guess just consider that little blabbing was instead of me typing all this out, which I usually prefer to type stuff out, but I was just like, man, I'm such a slow typer and I keep making mistakes and stuff. So I just rather type this thing out for the most part, I still left a little bit of typing and then I want to come back and just real quick explain it line by line so it's familiar. And uh, what the cool part is, is that all these lines don't even matter. Like the only lines that matter are this one right here. That's why I made this little abstract class because, uh, and you notice in Python, you can get away with just doing this, just defining, you know, just name a class, a real general name, and then uh, put a bunch of just method calls that are empty method calls pass means that's like a pair of empty braces in other languages and self is just i guess it's the modula 3 part of python where it's one of those give or takes when you design a language of like okay do you want to explicitly pass in a reference to the current object in a method or do you want that to be that like invisible this keyword and so python of course has chosen to pass in the word self which is also a way that like sort of makes it explicit i guess implicit and explicit at the same time it's implying that this is a method which is a function on an object and not like a class method more you know it's an instance method instead of a class method because it's getting this reference to its current instance so that's how one of the main ways that you know that this is an instance method. And so what happens is this is just, it's generic. All these things are there so that if I were to instantiate this, I'll hit F5 to save and run that. And then if I go, uh, you know, make a shape, a new shape object, just that you don't even have to use a new keyword or semicolons or nothing in Python in case you didn't know, um, then I can say just shape in this REPL interpreter here and it says it's a shape object. Okay, cool. And I'm going to call shape dot is parallelogram. And nothing happens because it was just like an empty set of curly braces. So the method's there, but it just, just the interface is there really. It doesn't do anything, right? So that's why the, 
I mean, it's a good idea to do abstract classes like this to define interfaces in a simplistic manner that's not bound to a particular implementation. I'll just leave all that jargon at that. If you're lean and intermediate programming, then that might have made some sense to you. But uh, anyway, that's just to show you what all this functionality is down here. All I've done is gone in and overridden all the methods that are up there, except for is square. Um, I did not override that one yet. And I did include, this is the same, this is a constructor method or also known as an initialization method because what do you do in a constructor? You initialize a new object and return it, you know? So that's what's going on there. And all we take is the top right, it, it's for quadrilaterals. So like, you know, uh, I have a little, some crude drawings here. So quadrilaterals are polygons with four sides. I think that would, I'm probably glossing over some details. I definitely am going to going forward. So don't expect this to be absolutely mathematically, holistically perfect, but I think for the most part, it should be okay. Um, so anyway, there's the top right, bottom left and bottom right. So top right, let me put this on a safe select, top right, bottom left, bottom right. Those are the only values we're passing in because everything, the origin is going to be zero, zero for all the other shapes. This one should have a zero, zero there too. So I'll give it one real quick. We'll have a zero comma zero right there. So, and then all these other ones, and it, it goes, you know, of course, left to right, top down. So kind of like you're reading a page like zero, zero, eight, zero, four, zero, eight, four. Okay. That's enough of that. These details don't really matter. What matters is just the most general concept that I'm trying to explain and probably using a little bit too much or way too much words to explain here. So a quadrilateral, I don't even have to say it extends this shape. The only reason I could just get rid of this if I wanted to and just be like, and that's fine. But the reason I did that and specifically extended shape, which adds, looks like it adds a little bit of complexity, but that's just so I could illustrate it right here. You know, and just say, hey, here's what's really going on down below. I've just overridden all that stuff. So that's why I did that. And in the real world, as you factor out your programs, a lot of times you are going to want to go back and do that and add some deals. But when you're coming in to do classes, don't do a shape class and then have quadrilateral inherit it. I didn't do that. When I wrote this, I did it without the shape class. This wasn't even there. I filled out this whole thing can't see my scroll bar sorry um, I filled out all this stuff right here and then I thought you know what now it looks complex enough to justify putting in a shape more abstract interface of a shape and then inheriting from that so that I can easily demonstrate it if that makes sense okay so anyway that's as much as I'm going to explain that and I'll move forward so we have this quadrilateral I've stuck to pretty much the parallelograms. I don't have um, trapezoids or chevrons or kites, stuff like that, because I don't care about them. What we're illustrating, those don't matter. So there's another thing to do with the class hierarchy is that like, if I was designing a class hierarchy, I'd be tempted from that, you know, heavy upfront design perspective of like, well, I don't, I'm not in the thick of writing the program yet. I'm just modeling what I might write. So I better go ahead and model out a uh, trapezoid and you know where that's going to inherit from and da, 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 da. No, <laughs> don't do none of that. Just start with what you need. So when I literally was starting this, I was like, originally going to start it is rectangle because I was like, okay, I'm just going to stick to rectangle square. And then I kind of did it a little bit and I was like, okay, trial and error. And I started factoring back out and I was like okay I'll call this a polygon no I'll call it a quadrilateral and stuff like that and that's all fine like you're gonna rename stuff as you go along the only time names get really important is once you like publish an API um, then you kind of want to stick with the method signatures the names stuff like that anything that's publicly accessible you want to do that otherwise you'd want to do like a major version um, upgrade right and like 
increment the major version number and stuff like that so it's best to try and avoid that and lean away from that but in your own development you should be finding yourself renaming like within a day or few after naming something the a project that you're like consistently working on and stuff so that's normal i just want to say and that's good because you'll think of better names as you go along and you can usually uh solve any problems by just doing a quick search and replace on the text you know so if it's that level of change then then you're all right but once you publish it like other people in an organization or other organizations or other individuals or whatever are using your code then of course you don't want to be just renaming stuff because that's going to just totally domino effect break their code and require each one of those groups individually to go back and like do massive overhauls and stuff so of course that's where you you save those changes you might document them or do a different branch for your um what you know your next major release and then just start working on them going forward from that point okay so all this does in python this is just like you can just ignore almost the fact that that is an init method because these uh well i guess you shouldn't but anyway you initialize all your instance variables in your init method in python and uh you don't initialize them outside the init method just because by convention you know this is the pythonic way to do it so that's all there is there for the most part it's kind of that's just the way it is you know so when you see this this is where in general in a python class you go in here and look for your instance variables and see what they're going to get assigned and of course like a regular constructor it can take you know it when it's a method defined within a class um, all the methods are going to get past self so if they that's the self-reference so you don't pass that when you call this you know what i mean you'll call it like the trick is is like kind of that if um if you're calling an object and you actually provide that object name you're like shape dot init or whatever you're calling you've already when you said shape that's the self that's going to get passed there if you you know like lowercase shape when i just named an instance that be earlier I think I started to record this video a little bit ago and then I stopped and restarted so I'm trying to cover stay a little bit more on point with it but anyway um, yeah so all this is doing is just initializing those values that come in we don't need that first value that top left value because it's zero zero and then these other values are gonna those are the ones we're gonna need obviously right so I do the eight zero zero four and the eight four you know pass those in they all get assigned then you come down here is parallelogram with a reference to itself and it comes in here and it's just one if block and it says or actually this is like one if condition right and then here's if true do that so it says uh if the top left x and the top right x which up here i did define a couple constants x equals zero y equals one that way instead of having zero and one indexing make the code more readable and uh, that's just why I did that. So it says if self top left X and top right X, the difference between top left X, I guess I should uh, get a better circle or thing. So the difference between that and that, which is gonna be eight, right? And uh, is compares with bottom left x and bottom right x oops bottom left x bottom right x so obviously the difference between 0 and 8 and 0 and 8 is going to be 8 for both of them right so if that's the case then return true it is a parallelogram so let's see why is that logic not clicking to me so this would even be a parallelogram here where this one's a rectangle and also a parallelogram it's with you know it's a subtype of a parallelogram right or a more special type whatever you want to think of it as um or you could think of it as we're not even going to think of it like that we're just thinking of it as a parallelogram uh and right here is also a parallelogram even though it's slanted you know skewed whatever sheared um so the way we tell that is the same way we deduct the two x values and then we deduct the second two x values find the difference between them and we realize that there's a difference of eight between them both and so 
that lets us know that it is in fact a parallelogram and the self bottom left and self bottom top left bottom left so then the the second thing it has to do is this it has to check that these ones are also equal length and so you can see that applies to the rectangle and to that sorry to like i said i'm i think i said i'm not a math expert or whatever and i'm not trying to be too holistic with this math stuff close out some of this extra stuff here um but those details don't even matter it doesn't even matter how i determine it's a parallelogram so don't even worry about that is a rectangle checks that is it a parallelogram because a parallelogram it's not a rectangle if it's not a parallelogram and we don't want to redo that code right so that's how we check if it's a parallelogram and if uh additionally if there's one square corner in it that's what this is checking is if the bottom left x and the top right y equals zero and the bottom left x is zero and the top right y is zero and the reason i can get away with that simple of an implementation is because zero zero is this origin this um implied origin or whatever it's a fixed origin right so if we want this would have to be like negative values down here to skew this over that way and uh it just stays keeps it simple and stays consistent and then is a rhombus so a rhombus has to be a parallelogram just like a rectangle has to be a parallelogram and the top right x and the needs to equal the bottom left y so the top right x eight needs to equal the bottom left y or the bottom right y top right x bottom left y top right x bottom left y so we can see this one's not a rhombus because the top right x is eight and the bottom left y is four same thing here so a rhombus would be more like this if i were to go in here if this was shaped more like this And then this and that. So right there we can see that need to clear that out, come in here. We can see here that this line and this line are congruent, this line and this line are congruent. Um that's a rhombus so it's a lot like a square but it doesn't have a square corner in it it has you know obtuse and acute angles and stuff like that but no right angles in it but it has two it has a pair of parallel lines um, and that also makes it a, so it's a congruent parallelogram completely congruent so a square is actually a rectangle because what defines a rectangle is that it's a parallelogram and it has a square uh, angle in it and if it has if it's a parallelogram and it has one square angle then all of the angles will be squared and that's the same thing for a square right but the square also means it's a rhombus which means that all four sides are congruent you know each pair of sides is congruent to the other and that just means that they're all equal you know congruent just means that this line segment right here if you can see my cursor um, this line segment right here is the same length as that line segment and this line segment is the same length as this line segment that's what congruent means and there's lots of other variations in there too so so if it is a rhombus i don't know if i made this clear or not but if it is a rhombus and it is a rectangle then it is a square <laughs> and that's how you determine if it's a square or not right now the thing is if you'll notice or if you probably have noticed is that all of these are in the same class rectangle parallelogram is rhombus and is square we're even going to add to the same class and that's the thing is they're all quadrilaterals you know what I mean? And if you have this quadrilateral that's potentially mutating, you know, even if you're returning new objects of itself, if if you're getting this effect of mutation, right? Then, uh, but especially if it's in place mutation, 
which a true dynamic object oriented language should do you should be able to mutate objects at whatever level like that's just the thing this whole thing of like constants and you know the const keyword in java script and all that that's bad that is not the reason it gets so confusing it's like yeah you can use it if you really want to to uh double check yourself especially if you're leaning more towards beginner programmer and stuff like that but there's just it's a you're not use you're not being a true object oriented programmer you know what i mean you're not following the right practices which i'm trying to help with right now um i don't claim to be perfect at this but i feel like i i'm on the right path for as far as what how this should go i'm not definitely obviously not the best at explaining it but i'm working on it so thanks for pitting up with me this far so you can see this whole interface this is what python itself promotes as the duck typing you know it's called a. Uh, what is it? It's not the look before you leap model. There's another acronym they use for it where it's like do it first, then ask permission or something like that. So it's like just try, just, you know, quit trying to be like, oh, is this a t this type of object, you know, and doing all these type checks and all that kind of stuff. Just ask it if it has this behavior. You know what I mean? Ask it, are you a circle? You know what I mean? Don't go and do this check where you're like, I'm going to determine as this outside entity whether or not you are a circle. An object is supposed to be as much as possible responsible for itself. So think of an object abstractly, I guess, like a person. You know, you should most of the time, as much as possible, be asking somebody politely, right? Like, what are you thinking? You know, what number are you thinking of? And the person will tell you, oh, here's the number I'm thinking of, right? If they want to or whatever, if they want to cooperate. So, or do you go in and you're like, oh, you know, I'm going to go uh, ask somebody else what you're thinking, what number you're thinking, or I'm going to try and deduce it myself, or I'm just going to, you know, look at what you're looking at over there on the wall and that might tell me or something you know i don't know those are bad examples probably but the thing is is that we ask we ask other entities for things we don't go in and think like you know um there's an interface there that's what it is it's that that politeness that that interface that policy and that's what we need to go through we need to not jump across these lines you know then you lose those boundary lines between objects and stuff when you do that and you're actually concerned about their internal implementation you know so the trick to pure object oriented programming is to try and manipulate behaviors in not a getter setter way getter setters are still leaning towards bags of data and hey if that's working for you just fine in whatever situation cool but obviously there's at some point if you're trying to like really expand your programming and shrink your code base and the complexity of things and make it just real simple real readable then this is more the way that you want to lean with stuff um you just you inquire you ask the thing and you know you make things you compose these objects of these things that you need the thing is uh, still a lot of these languages we use the best ones are like pure functional right but those are still so ivory tower i mean now people are writing programs that like real world programs with heavily functional languages and stuff but we see a lot of rule breaking especially in languages that just pull in or claim to pull in the functional paradigm which just do a really half-baked job at it um there's lots of principles from all the major paradigms that we can borrow from and always use you know there's lots of functional principles to use but trying to claim that oh i'm gonna program in javascript with a functional par pure functional paradigm it's like no you're not if you do you're gonna write a horrible javascript program i hate to say it but that's the truth so you can you know cherry pick a few principles from functional programming and keep those in mind and that's a good thing to do but don't think you're don't ever think you're programming functional in javascript you know maybe in the future at some point it could be it's on track to potentially be but um to this day as we speak i believe javascript 2020 uh es 2020 is the newest release and 
I didn't dig into that spec really super deep, but I've been lightly following along with, you know, some of the ES6 Plus stuff, which I'm not a fan of, honestly. Um, and I'm not seeing anything, you know, ES6 itself says there needs to be tail call optimizations. Uh, that was That's part of the thing to be fully ES6 compliant. And I don't know of a single interpreter, compiler, whatever, that does tail call optimizations. So without that, you cannot have a pure functional paradigm. You can almost have it, but the thing is, is your programs are gonna run horribly slow and anything that's like way complex is gonna blow the stack. And it's just, so <laughs> tail call optimizations are like the bare minimum. That's why they came in in ES6, I feel like, or they were supposed to, but nobody's implemented it yet for reasons unknown. I just, I've even seen Keto's excuses for not implementing them in Python. Um, I understand that Python's not a functional paradigm language, so there's not a whole lot of reason to even bother to do it. But his reasoning to me, I just read it once over real quick and it didn't even seem accurate. Like he was using examples that weren't tail calls. And he's like, how do you optimize this? It's like, well, that's not a tail call. A tail call has to be the very last thing, the absolute very last thing before a return statement has to be a recursive call to itself or whatever call, I guess, to any function. But, um, you know, especially in a recursive call in those types of situations. And so if the very last thing, you know, the right to left kind of thing as you come in, then if it calls itself or whatever another function, then you know that those variables aren't going to mutate. But if it's not the very last thing, that call in the program, it's up here somewhere in the function, then there's a possibility that things might get mutated. I don't know. It just, I'm not smart enough to talk about that stuff. And I'm talking about object oriented programming anyway. So what we're going to do is just tell me to shut up and hit F5 on this to save and run it. And I'm going to say Q equals a quadrilateral, a new quadrilateral. Did I spell it wrong? Oh, missing that. And uh, I was going to use these same parameters in here so I can skip the OO and do 800484. 800484. And I've got to clean it up a little bit here. Put it in some tuples. Okay, let's double check that. 800484, 800484. Okay, so that should give us the effectively that triangle. We're not gonna, I didn't make it obviously complex enough to, tuple object is not callable. Oh, I didn't do, excuse me, I didn't do commas. Why isn't it working? Oh, you got to go down here and do commas between the tuples. Okay, yeah, so in memory, it's that's what it is. It's, I'm not going to try and draw this stuff to the screen right now. Okay, so there's that rectangle in memory. So if we ask that object, is it a parallelogram? We get true, and if we ask it, is it a rectangle? I obviously like prefer to spell things out longhand. Um, and we can say, is it a rhombus? Shouldn't be false. So it's looking good. It's looking like it's working out because it is this, but in order for it to be a rectangle and a rhombus, it would have to be a square. And we know that we pit in this big shape, which is not a square. So that's all on track. So since a uh, rectangle and rhombus disagree, then we know we, do, we are not in a circle state. And that's the thing is the most important thing is it's, it's not an is a relationship, right? It is a leaning more towards a has a relationship, but as far as interfaces go, it has a shape interface in my implementation, the way you could describe it, right? It has a shape, quadrilateral, whatever. Um, 
but it's not directly inheriting from anything. All it inherited was an interface, not an implementation. That's the thing. Inherit abstract interfaces, not concrete implementations. Of course, sometimes you'll want to inherit concrete implementations, but you should be refactoring back to that in a situation where you're like, okay, I've already done this without using inheritance, and now I'm building up this monolithic object that is trying to be everything to everybody, then it's like, okay, maybe not. Maybe you need a more specialized object, and maybe what's common in this thing that you're building up a monolith and your specialized object over here, maybe you could factor that out to a little like base object that they both can inherit from, whether or not that's just interface or, or whatever amount of implementation or not is all up to the context and whatever you happen to be doing. But that's the way you work. You backtrack to classes or modeling. You know what I mean? You don't really model stuff ahead of time. And if you do, it should be more object modeling of thinking about behaviors and functionality that you want instead of specific little class interfaces that are boxed in little boxes all over the place, if that makes sense. So I'm not quite done here. What are we going to do now? Let's, uh, Let's change it so it's this one down here and make sure that it stays the it still agrees. So we can um we could just set the Q values. You know, I could ask for a new object or I could just say, you know, Q dot um what did I name them? Did I name them top left? Yeah, top right, bottom left, bottom right. Okay, so we'll do a we got the 80. Let's change it the bottom left and the bottom right to 1494. So bottom left. Equals a uh, 14 and Q dot bottom. So what we can see there, you know, it's obviously this top line's exactly the same. It's eight units long. Um, the bottom line's also eight units long, but it kicks over one on the X scale before it, it starts doing itself. But the difference between nine and one is still eight, right? Um, just in case you didn't know, I should have explained this way earlier, but the origin is up there. Something more like, ah, come on. It's like this and like that. And this corner up here is zero, 0, right? I guess it's obvious because down here you've got the 8, 4 thing. So the X values grow this way, like normal, but the Y values grow downward, all from the upper left corner, right? That's the way computer graphics usually work, where they go up to this corner up here and blast out in positive energy, integers for the width and heights and stuff. Okay, so now that it's that, let's ask it what it is. Is parallel? Yep. Are you a rectangle? No, it, and that's good because it's not, right? It's this thing down here, but the big version, this big, almost like a skewed rectangle. And, uh, so it is a parallelogram, it is a rectangle, is it a rhombus? Nope, that's right. Okay, so if we want to make it a rhombus, we could change the uh, bottom right and the top right to be only four units out of uh, a vector of a delta of four, right? I don't know if those are the right terms, but anyway so q dot top right is going to equal a zero comma four and q dot top or bottom right uh it's going to equal i already forgot um one comma four, one comma five, 
is 9 minus 4. 1 comma 5. Okay, so now will Q tell us what it is? Uh, Q dot top left. Q dot top right. Q dot bottom left. And Q dot bottom right. So there we have our our deals there. So what that should give us here is effectively this little light green rhombus in here because we got zero zero of course and we got zero four which is half of eight. Ooh. That one needs to be four zero. Okay. Four comma zero. And then we've got a one four and a should be a 5-4. 5 comma 4. Glad I checked that. Okay. So now that it's like that, this is a rhombus, so this should not be a rectangle. It should be a parallelogram, and it should be a rhombus. And this is just by changing these values. We're now able to do this, right? Q dot is parallelogram. True is rectangle. Ah. False. Q dot is rhombus. True. Okay, so that's all good. So, of course, now the next thing left to do is to turn it into that square and see if it can tell if it's a square or not. So what we need to do is kick this back over to zero, like this one, and then kick this back down to an eight, and that will just shift that bottom line back over one, and it should be uh, much more rectangular, and then it will also still be in the rhombus state. So that's what we're doing, is we're just inquiring like what state it's effectively in. Um, so Q dot bottom left needs to be a zero comma zero for the x value and then a four down and then q dot bottom right needs to be a bottom right needs to be four four Okay, let's make sure I got this right. So top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. Okay. Top left zero zero, top right four zero. So you can tell because the X is the horizontal distance, the horizontal vector, right? And then this is going to be the up and down and the up and down and the horizontal. All right, so we should be in a square state. Now let's ask it, Q dot is rhombus. Yep. Q dot is rectangle. Yep. Is parallelogram? Better be. Yep. And you can also see that, just a quick reminder that I've reused stuff like the more general calculations right here. I did self is parallelogram. I called that method, which is right here. And it's a uh, that's reusing that code obviously to say yes, it's a parallelogram because, in addition to qualifying as a parallelogram, to make sure it's not a chevron or one of those other ones, right? Okay, now if we ask it, are you a circle or excuse me, are you a square? Nothing happens, and the reason nothing happens is because over here I've still got is square pass that's defined so it didn't give us an error because the methods there um, in through inheritance that that interface is there but it's not implemented so all we got to do is implement it and here's the thing of how easy that is is def is square and then we just say if uh, self is um, rectangle and self dot is 
So people say like, oh, you know, object-oriented programming falls short of real world, whatever. They're obviously wrong. We're this is exactly from the little for the most part. I kind of like skimmed over a math book I have that's a pretty good one, pretty simple good one. Um, and I'm just going off of that. You know what I mean? Like, what are the basic properties that say? what a square is like how can i define a square very simply and it's like well it's got to be in a rectangular state of having you know a parallelogram that has a right angle and it also has to have a pair of congruent sides so by we're basically composing the answer so to speak by doing this i'm not trying to say that's like quote unquote composition or whatever but in a sense i feel like it is um and it leans towards that way of thinking too so is if it's all that then that means return true because it is a square and otherwise it's not a square and return false okay so now we can save and run that and then we'll just grab that same object we had if i can find it is this it 8404 let's do the one that's not as okay yeah we'll do the one that's not a square first right and then or i guess i can just high, click on the line and hit enter and then uh come on okay oh i must have gone back too far i forgot to put the commas all the way back to that one okay comma comma okay I can come up here and click on, oh man, I hate typing. And it's getting dark, so I'm getting worse at typing. Because I stare at the screen and it's too bright. And then I have to look at my keys if I'm like narrating a video and trying to type. Otherwise I make like 50 million mistakes a million times a day. Okay, so Q dot is rectangle. Q dot is parallel. O gram Q dot is rom rhombus. Um, did I forget anything? Parallelogram rectangle rhombus, and now is square, right? So Q dot is false. Good, that's right, because this one's not a square yet, right? So Let's take this one, edit it out, and change that to a four zero, a zero four, and a four four. Now this should be a square. So let's just go and ask it, are you a square? Yep. Are you a rhombus? Yep. Are you a rectangle? Yep. Are you a parallelogram? Yes. So that's how that works. And then you could do things to be like, say you wanted to uh, get the radius. Or I always want to think circle instead of square. Sorry. But if you want to get like, if you want to manipulate it like that, like using the more simplistic interface, I guess. I don't know why that's absolutely necessary. In nature, there's really no such thing as perfect squares or perfect circles that we know of. Um, there's always some force acting on it that's distorting or contorting or whatever it you know like it's just there's always something <laughs> nothing's perfect right that we know of at least so this is all just abstractions anyway but if you want that circular interface you can provide it or excuse me square interface in this context if you're thinking of uh, the circle ellipse problem then you know obviously if you want a circle interface in that then you can use this method so this is the way that you would check is like is this in this state you ask the object you inquire the object you don't forcefully like box out this object and limit yourself like that you know what i mean you or you could just provide an interface that's like you could just not even have the is square thing necessarily if you didn't want like this you know like you could even argue that this is too much um exposing the state and not fully encapsulating and abstracting it 
but I think it's leaning more towards abstracting it and encapsulating it. But anyway, um, you could just offer whatever to where somebody could like provide a radius object in the circle case, you know, as um as a part of like a way to construct an ellipse is to just provide that that radius, you know, as a singular value. Think in those terms. Obviously I'm being really vague, like I don't want to get too specific, but think about passing objects. Instead of passing multiple parameters, now we're getting to the day and age where it is more feasible to literally turn everything into an object. And these interpreters and compilers and stuff are getting more and more efficient. I would say over the last 10 to 15 years, these uh, they've gotten very efficient. Like Java's very efficient at rapidly creating new little objects and stuff like that you know in this half of java's existence for example so it's like you can really go in and kick and plus computer memory in general is like so much more right but hey you might end up constrained on a mobile phone like with whatever resource limitations or just wanting to minimize resource usage which is usually ideal you know that's going to save power that's going to leave room for other applications to coexist all those kinds of things um and then if you're doing more of like embedded programming obviously you need to really conserve your resources but the resource optimis is an optimization resource you know adjusting resource usage tuning resource usage is an optimization so in that aspect if you're just prototyping loosely and stuff consider using an object unless building that object you have to go create a class and do a bunch of junk like that then it's like uh then maybe just use some loose variables you know or a list or something like that um that that's sort of the way to go there but you always want to be considering the object and then once things get complicated to where you're like oh man i gotta pass like a dictionary um at the point the dictionary is kind of like a deciding factor that's a bag of data that's a bag of key value pairs right so do you want to pass a bag of key value pairs that might be all right especially going with the keep it simple thing but maybe you want to also uh start bundling in that behavior with it and then if you're going to start bundling in any behavior you're in object land and now it's time to consider why not make behavior primary instead of this data now and that may even make mean breaking apart that dictionary or something but everything there should be like a consideration step before you absolutely go and do that step you know to whatever degree so maybe there's like some sort of commit to the source or like micro commits or whatever um that you would that would happen in between those phases and then you're like okay i'm gonna go up now and just do this refactor commit or whatever type of thing like that so that not something in a in a bigger more open production that you'd want to be i don't know i don't i don't feel like it's good to refactor at the same time it, it's good to have all those commits isolated into little atomic commits and stuff but anyway i hope this you know maybe this illustrates that fact right here of just how simple that was I, the gist of it is i just provided an interface and if it's a square it returns true you know what i mean if it's in the square state it could change rapidly in and out of the square state but at whatever time you pick to observe it is it a square state at that specific moment that, that you fire off that event or whatever you do to check it um then it's going to tell you hey i happen to be a square right now and it could be a square all day long forever or whatever for a whole year you know or it might be a square for a split second once a year whatever it doesn't matter right so and you can see there's no complicated class hierarchies like i said i didn't even need this one i just put it in there in, the, in there for mostly illustrative purposes um keep it simple and then the next most important principle is keep it dry don't repeat yourself so keep it stupid simple like i did right here these implementations don't even matter this is just you know cover that with your hand when you're looking at this right that's what this effectively does it gets rid of all the implementation so all you see is just the gist of what you care about as the uh, third party user of this library or framework or object or whatever it happens to be you know a module I, I'm working on the explanations, you know, I know that I could have explained this way better or whatever. But anyway, thanks for watching.